and Leonardo da Vinci, not because he painted the Mona Lisa, which he did, but because also 2019 marks the 500 years that he passed away. So he died in 1519, and he sort of history portrays him as, as you know, the first and probably most remarkable genius of mankind. He was a painter, he was an artist, but he was also an inventor. Yeah, so he invented great many things in the 15th and 16th century, amongst other things, the, the crossbow, a machine gun, a, a diving suit, and a humanoid robot. And as you know, or you may know that 500 years later, they're slowly catching up with some of these visions. And in fact, some universities took the job and they tried to build to his specifications, to his designs, the things that he invented, in other way of the materials and some other <coughs> Now, so he's the inventor um, that when, when people talk about inventors, usually that's the name that comes around. I want to talk about invention, but I want to tell you a different story. Um, this is a car, a car that people call the Hackrod. The Hackrod is a car that's been developed for fun driving. It looks a little bit like a Mattel car, you know, one of these little metal cars that drive around, where you go in for fun. And the interesting thing about this is, this car was not invented by humans. In fact, this is a car that no human could ever build or could have ever invented. Uh, so there's no deal Da Vinci standing behind this. So I want to tell you a little bit about this story because this is one of the cases that we're actually studying at the most actual car, uh, which is a car that exists, that it's out there that it can drive. That wasn't designed, invented, or even built by humans. So how was it built? Who invented the Hackrod? First of all, a thing that's called the generative design engine. The generative design engine is basically a piece of software that you give a little bit what you expect as an output. Say, uh, I want something to sit on. And you tell them a few constraints, like it needs to carry uh, 80 kilograms of weight. <laughs> yeah. And the generative design engine then by itself generates a design that meets these criteria. So this example of the chair is not that I just made up, this is actually one of these generated, uh, a, ch a chair that was generated by an algorithm. Yeah? So you tell them I want something to sit on, it needs to fulfill certain constraints, and you go and tell me what the design is. And the design of the hacker is the same thing. So they said, we wanted a car, the car should go very, very, very fast, and it should obviously be safe. Click on a button, tell me what such a car with a chassis could look like. Then the next thing is, they didn't build the car either. They basically used a very fancy 3D printer. So they took the design output that the program, that the software built, and uh, submitted it to a 3D printer, not the one that you can buy at Aldi, one that can print 3D, uh, that print titanium alloys, a little bit more robust. But still, this is what it looked like. Yeah. So the third part that they did is, they didn't even drive the car. Yeah, so they, they basically had a 3D version of that thing, put it into virtual world reality, <coughs> so a software program that mimics the real world, but isn't the real world, and drove around there. So one of the things, for example, is they simulated a wind tunnel, because the guys that were interested in the hack road didn't have a wind tunnel at their disposal. So they simulated the sort of forces and the sort of airspeed at 10 meters forth, um, and simulated how the car would go at very, very high speeds. And only after all of this was done, they basically put the button and the car was built. Yeah? And you might wonder now, this, okay, this is great, this is a very cool product invention, where are the people? Yeah? So I'm telling the story a little bit as if a, a, a computer, a robot sort of design of this. Of course there were humans involved in that. But let's look closer to what they did here. They do look on a piece of paper, this is a sketch that they made. They drove a regular car, some car, in the Mojave Desert, so some desert in the US, and they put themselves some biosensors and force load sensors on their bodies and on that regular car, drove at the high speed they could find to get, generate data that the design engine and the virtual reality and the simulation engine could use. And the third thing they did is they played a video game. Yeah, so to test drive that car, they took a 3D computer version of that car, and then did one of the regular motorcycling uh, uh, car video games that you can have. So that the, by the time the car actually hit the road, it had over a million miles of test driving in it, just not in the real world. And of course, 
What they're doing at the moment is they're running around trying to sell the car. Yeah, so they go to the EIA and some other of these big automotive um, uh, conferences and sell the car. The funny thing is, uh, this is Mickey McManus. This is one of the guys that works with them on this, and this is Moss McCoy. Moss McCoy is a stunt uh, man, and this guy worked for Mattel for a while. Okay. Mickey Mouse built the car. Mickey Mouse. Um, but they're not designers. <coughs> they never worked in the automotive sector. They've never worked in the industry of manufacturing. Just a bunch of geeks and nerds and this guy Stuntman. They wanted to build really cool cars. They relied on a whole lot of digital products to help them invent and eventually build such a car. And this is sort of the motives of my lecture. What I want to talk about is how these digital technologies think or make us rethink what we know about inventions and innovation, how these things come to be. Yeah? Technologies fundamentally change how we think about innovation and invention. Yeah? Think about it. This is a car, an industrial scale car. It weighs several hundred kilos. Yeah, it takes a little, it's a very complex object to build it. I, I read once that a car has about 150,000 individual parts that need to come together. And essentially, a whole bunch of algorithms and other digital products, like a printer, simulation, virtual reality environment, a generative design algorithm, allow them to create a car with any, without any big knowledge in that domain or in these process before. Of course, and this is the big move, right? The idea that digital technologies help us with innovation isn't necessarily new. For example, we've seen this in what we call uh, digital native companies and digital native products. Yeah, video games, for example. Yeah? Video games have always existed only in the digital space. Yeah? There's no physical product anymore. There's no physical material that you need to glue together as you know, staple the screw. They operate entirely in the software out in the cloud on the internet. And here in these companies, they've been doing digitally driven innovation for a much, much longer time. So, for example, my, my friend Stefan over here, he's been studying Ubisoft, and now we're doing this together. Ubisoft, which is a leading video game publisher, sits in France and in Paris, amongst others, and they've been using so-called procedural generation engines that help them to build, design video games. And this is an example of a game called Ghost Recon Wildland. Basically, the idea is called an open world, so it's it's a massive landscape, and you can wander around freely yeah, with your little video game character. So what that means is that you have to design every facet, every accent of the uh, of the mountains, of the landscapes, of the roads, of, of rivers, and everything else you have in such an environment. And they're using software engines that design these things for them. Even they don't have to design manually every pixel of this. Yeah? So they've been using digital products to automate some of the invention already in an entirely digital space. It's already impressive, but what we see now is that some of these ideas from companies that operate on only in the digital world yeah. are taking over part of the digital world. For example, pizza. Yeah. Um, I, when I prepared for this talk, I read up a little bit on Hawaiian pizza. Can you show a show of hands who likes Hawaiian pizza and who hates it? Who likes it? Uh, 30, 40 percent who hates it. <laughs> so the funny thing is, so. Uh, this splits the world, yeah? This is a matter of the low interest in security. Yeah? Yeah. So Australians rank Hawaiian pizza as the number one pizza, yeah, by far, in, a, in, a, in the US. Uh, Pineapple on the pizza is one of the top three worst toppings ever, next to anchovies and mushrooms, by the way, yeah? So it's so far that the Iceland uh, president, the president of Iceland in 2017, uh, he made a very famous statement saying like he would pass a law to ban from uh, uh, pineapple from pizza, and it caused a whole lot of politicians, uh, Justin Trudeau, commented on it, and the Italian Pizza Inspectorate. The Italian Pizza Inspectorate is an actually government body that controls and regulates what you put on a pizza. So this is serious business, yeah? And of course, this is a human invention. What we see now are computer-generated pizza topics. Yeah? A bunch of guys at MIT, in a project which is really interesting, WWW, how to generate almost anything, they created a pizza dishes entirely crafted through an algorithm that, that looks at, well, which flavors might go well together. They have blueberry spinach and feta, or my personal favorite, shrimp jam and Italian sausage. They do this for everything. This is pizza, I went through the news. They do this for perfumes. They've been doing this for music, where they had a, a pianist, uh, the one on the piano, playing next to an algorithm composing a song in tandem together. 
Um, in fact, the only thing they don't generate are the names of the pizzas. Yeah, yeah. like this. Uh, uh, sure, Familia Rocks Pizza or Pizza Brexit, maybe. Yeah. Um, so, a digitally produced pizza. So, what we see here is basically three steps of digitizing products that used to be human inventions, quite physical. Yeah. A very simple way of doing this is a conversion. Yeah. You take a physical object and turn it into a digital object. Yeah, I'll give you a certain example in a minute what that looks like. The other version of that is you do augmentation, what I call augmentation. You take a physical product and you wrap it with digital features, or features that can operate in the digital world, and gives you some of the capabilities of a piece of software. Yeah, think of a toothbrush with a sensor that becomes a smart toothbrush, so to speak. Yeah. Or the third version is digital infusion, where you really take a physical object and you infuse it with digital capabilities that really bring meaning and identity to this process. Let me give you three examples. This is digital conversion. We take a physical product and we convert it into a digital version. Yeah, you are know, as old as me, I'm apparently 40 as you just learned. Um, you, you use the boarding passes at an airport. Yeah, that's what we use for traveling with airplanes. And now obviously we have digital boarding passes that operate on your laptop, on your mobile phone maybe. Right, so uh, on Saturday I came back from Umea in Sweden. Uh, flight was delayed and I had to do a lot, whole lot of uh, rechecking and rerouting and rebooking. I never had a piece of paper in my hand. Yeah, so I literally wandered through the different airports that I had to travel through and every now and then I got a, a text message or an email or something like this and said, it's a new boarding house. Yeah, what used to be a physical object is now a digital object and as you can tell from this story, it infuses them with certain capabilities, like it, it can change. In the good old days, if I had to re rebook, I had to go to the service counter, wait for my boarding pass, place it there, then they print out a new one and that's my new one. And you see the sign on my new flight. Now I get an email update that automatically changes the flight number, and my seat or whatever it may be. So things can look different. Digital augmentation, I said, these are uh, physical products that are kind of adding, where I'm adding a few digital features. Yeah? Thermomix in Wuppertal, that's a good example. It's basically a cooking machine, but it gets a few digital capabilities, for example, with uh, the fact that it can download recipes over the internet and give you instructions. Uh, this on the right hand side is a case that we're actually studying. We don't work with Thermomix, but we work with Lockitron. Lockitron is a provider and they're building smart door lock solution. Well, to build a smart door lock solution, you actually have to take a physical door lock and add a few things that enable you to do the in the digital world. And you need a Bluetooth adapter, you need to connect to the internet somehow, you need to write a piece of software that can speak to this thing, so to speak. Yeah. And the digital infusion example, this is the sort of latest generation of digitalization that we see. For example, where we have cars, like Tesla cars, that you can update through software and it takes on new meaning. Yeah? So you may know that the current generation of Tesla cars, if you're rich enough to have one, um, there are many different moments, but if through a software update, they already have the capability of driving by themselves. And imagine what that does to the meaning of driving a car, when all of a sudden from tomorrow onwards, you don't call the shops anymore, and you don't need to make the decision whether to stop at Vivo and Edeka anymore, but the algorithm decides to Yeah? So what do we see here? What we see here, oh sorry, yeah, let me let me take you one step further just to show you how, how radical this idea is. So when you look at cars for a long time, one of the worst things that could happen to a car producer is that if you have to recall cars. And there's plenty of these examples where you have to launch a recall, which means you physically have to track down all the cars that are out there, they have some fault. You have to bring them back into the workshop yeah, and fix some. Yeah, let's say you're Volkswagen and people found out and they busted you on the diesel thing and then now they're trying to avoid having that recall where they have to bring everyone back and remanufacture part of that, um, uh, that, that diesel engine. Yeah, so that happens to many car producers. This is an example from Ford. And of course Tesla has the same thing. Yeah? Tesla had issues and they had to recall a particular model, the Model S, which is one of the, the, the cars that they had built. But the big difference is, you know, that they said, hang on a second, we do have a recall. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to bring in your car. You don't physically recall any cars here. We'll just, you know, <coughs> play in another software update overnight while you sleep. And the car is fixed. Yeah. So what we see here is that we bring certain characteristics and capabilities that we know in the digital world and we bring them to very physical, concrete products. Yeah? And that's what happens on these 
three levels where you convert products, you augment them, or you even infuse them. Yeah? And there's a lot of research on, on what actually happens there. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples here. So for, for example, um, they say what, what academics use, funny words, what we call them, <coughs> which means they can change. Yeah, the, four, the, the, the Tesla car, you can change what the car does and how it does things through a software engine. Yeah, the Thermomix can do that as well. The smart tooth process, if it's really smart and connected, it can do this as well. Why? Because they're self-referential. We can address them. They become objects that we can talk to or even that can talk to one another. Yeah? The other thing that happens is what I call footprinting, which means because they add some physical characteristics, they also leave data. Lots and lots and lots of data. Yeah. Yeah, when, you, uh, when you're on Facebook and you do certain things, you do know that you leave data. You know, when you browse around on Amazon, you do know that you leave data on Amazon that they use for analysis, for prediction, to make recommendations, and so forth. Obviously, every digital object leaves a lot of data. Everything that it does leaves a footprint and trace somewhere that becomes available that you do this. Yeah? So the third thing in the middle, independent agency, means they have the ability of doing something on their own. Yeah? At the moment, this is a big deal in the press when you read about robots, artificial intelligence, and so forth. I don't want to get in too deep into whether or not artificial intelligence is really intelligent, but it's really that they can do stuff. They can do some things by themselves. The smart door lock is a piece of software uh, that can unlock doors. Yeah? The thermomix is a thing that can actually cook a little bit. Not very well, but better than most. Yeah? And why is this a big deal now? Well, one of the reasons it's a big deal now is that it's happening on a much, on a completely unprecedented scale. This is a graph that shows the evolution of the world population. Yeah, so we're sitting somewhere here, a bit over 7 billion people, and, and that's the information. This is a graph that shows the number of digital connected objects. So things like a smartphone, like a door lock, like a thermomix, that are on the planet, connected, and can speak to one another over the internet and other things. And as you can see, since 2009, we have more things than people on the planet. And these days, we have about 30 billion connected objects at the moment. I should say that we have about 200 billion electronic or, or digital objects. 30 billion of which they talk to one another. And these 200 billion objects feed off 50 billion sensors. So sensors are little things that track and collect and store and put them somewhere. Yeah? Smart sensors um, and these sorts of things. So we have much, much more of these objects around than we ever had before. And importantly, also more than people. At the same time, we also are building quite a lot in artificial intelligence. So not only do we have more technology, more digital objects flying around, and they are more and more connected on unprecedented scale, they also get smarter. If you put these two things together, smarter things, and more of them, and more data, and they can, they can talk to one another, this is why we have a lot of unprecedented digital realm that can actually do a lot of things that were not thought possible before. Which is why I want to go back to this idea of what does it have to do with innovation and invention. I want to show you a little bit about how that has been changing invention and innovation processes. Yeah, like the 500 years that passed between Da Vinci sketching his ideas for a machine gun and the hack was that was being built. Uh, go to the second person, Thomas Alva Edison, which apparently a lot of people also didn't know who that was. Uh, Thomas Alva Edison is actually still the most productive inventor in human history. And there's about a thousand patents in his name, and you probably all know him because he invented the light bulb. And he also claims to have invented the telephone, um, all that's disputed, and other things. So, the image that we have of Edison and of Da Vinci and some of these other inventors is some genius old white male, of course. Uh, some genius guy sits in his lab, lots of equipment, plays around until he crafts a new innovation, you know, a new innovative object that then goes out and, and masters the world. And this is obviously a regime we still see. For example, my wife and I were in uh, Duisburg a couple of weeks ago. They took a trip on a campus tour, and they uh, showed us one building where they said they have 805 scientists working in the R&D, the Research and Development Lab at Tussin Crook, a big steel manufacturer in, in the rural area. Um, just a useful, yeah? it has 90 R&D locations worldwide. Just by, for comparison, Cologne has 500 professors, 70 women, that's not the point right now. But, uh, yeah, so this is massive scale. 
But it's the same model. They put, take a building, put a bunch of smart guys into this, and say, you guys, here's a lab, here's equipment, you guys go, guys go and invent stuff. Yeah? The regime that we call it is basically known as what we call the state shape model. The state shape model is basically a model where you say, like, well, you have an idea, you see where that works. And you build a prototype of it, you see where that works. And you build a bigger, better version of it, you see where that works. And at any one point in time, there's a gate, and you can stop that inventing process when you find out what doesn't work. Yeah? Guy in the lab, Edison, Einstein, Da Vinci, you know, all these other guys, or even the guys that just improve, sitting there inventing stuff, seeing whether it works and moving on. Of course, that's not the only way to do invention or innovation. Uh, NASA, for example, they had the problem that they need medical kits on their manned spacecraft, yeah? and they have no idea what they need. Yeah, because they do it, they go to areas where no human has ever been before, they travel for as long, they, they try and predict a lot of very unlikely and likely scenarios that everything can happen in other space. So to solve that challenge, to determine the optical content of men, they said, we can't solve this ourselves, let's put this out there, and we asked, uh, in this case, Harvard Business School, and a company called Top Coder, and said, hey guys, can you help us solve this problem for us? So they did a process that people call open innovation. They gave data and they gave the problem out to the world, and the world responded and, and had submissions. Yeah? So the, the guys from Top Coders, they had around 23,000 people <coughs> all over the world submitting ideas for an algorithm that could help NASA solve that problem of what should be my medical bag in my space shuttle when the next time I'm yeah, And by the way, the price for this was $25,000. And the front side seat that take the never take and watch the space shuttle go into go into orbit. Uh, this is a regime we call open innovation. Yeah. So very different from the Justin Brook example or even from Edison, where you sit in a room, where you sit in a building, or you're within a, a corporate setting and you work on the ideas. You actually let ideas come in from the outside. So you either go out with the problems, you go out with the data, or you go out with anything else, and you go selectively to outside of the organization and say, hey guys, you come in and help us solve this problem. Yeah? So in other words, you reach out to, to, to people outside of the organization. But there's even different ways. Um, this is an example, I was still in Australia, we, we talked to uh, Coca-Cola for a while, and at that time, this is about 12 years ago, they came up with a vending machine that basically allowed people to mix their own type of Coca-Cola product. So it was a big vending machine with lots of buttons, and behind every button was basically, basically a capsule of the particular brand of flavor that you wanted to. So if you wanted to have a Sprite Fanta Coca uh, with a little hint of strawberry, you press on this button and out comes the drink that you wanted. Yeah, so basically, you tell the customers, you tell me yourself what the product is that you want. Any guesses what happened to that? So, everyone tried the Fanta Sprite Cola strawberry mix. Found out it was fairly disgusting. And then went back to pressing just Coca Cola or Zero, if that's your thing. And then, you know, so they stopped the entire initiative because it didn't really give you give them great new product ideas because everyone, everybody wanted the brand and product that they knew. Yeah? But the idea was interesting. And we see this somewhere else as well. Yeah, Starbucks did the same thing. They called it My Style Starbucks Idea. And they said, You tell us what sort of vanilla flavored latte you would want and what sort of bagel and cookie, etc., you want. You tell us. What, what you want, and Starbucks builds it. That's it, they use the web page for this. This is one of the famous examples, even more famous examples, actually Lego. Lego, the Danish company. The interesting thing about this is, they also said, you tell us what the Lego product is that you want, and we'll build it and sell it for you. The interesting thing with Lego is, they have received all these ideas from the product, even though they didn't have So, over the last 50 or so years, Lego nerds had been submitting their product ideas to Lego anyway, whether they wanted it or not. And at some stage, you got so many of them in the late 90s, they said, well, Jesus Christ, may as well make money with it, given that you've sent us all these letters and so forth. Anyway, so this is a famous example, some nerd built the Back to the Future and DeLorean, yeah, and even the little figures, and in fact, you can buy it. Yeah. Uh, another famous example is someone built the, the Star Wars Star Destroyer, big uh, space shuttle thing. And you can buy that too for 800 euros, I believe. I wanted it for my birthday to be good. You know, to get, to get the idea. So, and as they're doing it, actually by now, you don't even have to build these products with your own Lego bricks. You can do this in 
entirely in a virtual space. So they created an online platform where you can virtually build Lego products. And if they like it, they basically, you know, craft the box, put all the bricks in it, the, 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 the bricks in it, print out the, the schema and the plan, and send it over here to buy it. Yeah. This regime is what people call crowd innovation. Yeah. So recall we had Stagegate in an organization, whether you're big, like Tissue Group or small, like Edison, sit in a room with a lab, play around with your ideas, and you go through the system stage gates. Or you do open innovation where you selectively open the boundaries of your organization, you open the door a little bit to others, and let them help you innovate. Crowd based innovation is basically you take the boundaries and you make them open wherever you can. You let ideas from the outside come in, you give problems to the outside world. Sometimes you can even open up the design process. Yeah, like IKEA, you don't, they don't assemble the product for you, you have to do it yourself. Yeah. So these are all crowd innovation products. Now if you put them, put them all together, you get an interesting timeline. Yeah? From the, your R&D uh, department at the innovation source, to your vendor suppliers, your corporate partner at the innovation source, to the crowd, to users and customers at the innovation source. So what you're doing, you're gradually opening this up. Yeah? So invention is not anymore the function of a mastermind who's brilliant and, and a genius. It's sort of selective things that are open and bring other people in. Yeah? Of course, you see also other types of processes. So from a stage case to an open innovation, a crowdsourcing model. What that means essentially is you have to make the work in a different language. Yeah? To give you one example, when Starbucks launched its starbucksidea.com, Page, they got about 150,000 ideas within a couple of weeks. Sounds like a lot, right? And, and then they said, oh my god, what do we do with 150,000 ideas? We promised every single person feedback. And so they had to hire staff to read all these ideas and get back to the people who submitted them and said, thank you very much, this is a great idea, we're not going to do it, or we will going to do it. So they had to invent all sorts of new processes of how to deal with all these ideas that they had generated. And they weren't prepared for this. Yeah? So what we see now, what we see with the hack world, is entirely new to regime. Yeah? So where we had from customer vendors, suppliers to the crowd, we now involve digital technology, digital objects, digital products. And with this, we need an entire new set of processes and capabilities. And this is the stage that has been launched yeah, by some of the digital native companies, like the video game producers I showed you or um, the Hackerlot example, or even the guys at MIT that built that computer-generated pizza. Yeah. They're changing the processes and the sources of the ideas and the process of how to handle them. What we also see a little bit here is, what we see is, is a shift from basically a very human-driven process to a very digital-driven process. Yeah. So you saw that in the open innovation space, people already made use of web infrastructures. Crowd, most of the crowd-based innovation ideas make heavy use of, of, of the web and, and sort of technological infrastructure. They need some place to be able to uh, handle 150,000 ideas, to filter them, to assess them, to build them, and so forth. Yeah, like Lego, who had an entirely virtual product design platform that everyone can use. Here, of course, we're entirely or mostly digital driven. Yeah, where I showed you the example that the hacker people, they do it around, they just drove the car and they're running around selling the car, but the influence is a lot less. Yeah. And this is the stage where we're at, and this is one of the fascinating things of, of modern time of 2019. We say, like, how is this trajectory, as we move more towards the right, how do we handle this? Yeah, what happens to the people? How do the processes change? And of course, also, what's the outcome of all this? Yeah? What sort of inventions are we going to generate this way? Well, so let me talk a little bit about implications here. One of the obvious implications is you move toward the right um, and become more and more digital driven in your innovation process, uh, scale and speed go up tremendously. Yeah? So when I said in the beginning, um, just improve as 800 people, you could say that University of Cologne, 500 professors thinking about innovative stuff more or less all the time. Um, that sounds like an impressive number. Edison, uh, 1,000 a bit patients <laughs> over his life, and that's an impressive number. Yeah, my Starbucks idea to come generate 150,000 ideas in a, in a couple of weeks. Yeah, uh, Lego has millions of users um, submitting ideas. So the scale skyrockets. 
yeah? as he moved on, not only scaled skyrockets, but also the speed, of course. Yeah? Yeah, what, what took Edison for a thousand patients his entire life takes probably 800 scientists into two group a little bit less, takes Starbucks a couple of weeks, it took the hackers a couple of days to figure out how the design works. In fact, probably a couple of minutes, depending on how powerful their computer was. Yeah, so scale and speed change very rapidly. If you think about what do you need to be able to be good at to be an inventor anymore, um, what it also happens as you move towards the right towards digital driven innovation is you need to be able to deal with data. Yeah, so this is where this entire conversation that we see in the press and of course also in the academic discourse about big data, data analytics, data sciences and so forth where they come up and which is why by the way that the police decided we've got to have a data analytics course in our faculty as well. And we need to have people able, that are able to deal with these amounts of data yeah, that are being generated as we have more objects and people on the web that we can handle many many more ideas, solutions, problems, variables at a much unpredictable scale. Yeah. So data scientist Thomas Davenport from Babson in, in Boston, he called it out probably 10 years ago and said, like, look, why, watch out people, this is going to be the sexiest job of the 21st century. We need people that are able to do this sort of stuff. Now this is not just math, but math and big numbers if you want. So scale and speed, different requirements that we have. Yeah. If you think about the hacker example that I gave in the beginning, I said, but these guys were not car manufacturers. They were not industrial manufacturers, they were not designers. One of them was a stunt driver, and the other guy worked for a toy company, for Mattel. And they built a car. And I've never built a car myself. I mean, I tried as a kid and failed, but nothing like this, right? So we have people that have mastered some of the data, yeah, and some of the digital tools that you have at your disposal these days. That's all it takes to be a very good inventor. And in fact, if you talk to Mickey McManus, he said that's the entire point of the hackathon. He said that everyday person with everyday capabilities, with the digital tools at their disposal, you can build stuff like this. Yeah? So I, once, I wasn't involved in this, but there's also a study on, on regular 3D printers, the type of 3D printers you can buy at Aldi for a couple of hundred euros. Uh, how that spawned entire businesses that sell stupid stuff like uh, whistles for referees of uh, soccer games. Yeah? You can 3D print a whistle, so if you ever need a whistle, you just press a button and have it yourself. Yeah? And, and design and all of that becomes much easier at your own fingertips. Of course, the question then becomes, well, are these inventions that are more data-driven, uh, faster and more, you know, larger, so to speak, in volume, are they better? Yeah, are they more creative? And again, I'm piggybacking here <laughs> Stefan, who uses this example. This is a, a, a game, a video game again, this is called Long and Sky. It's a video game that's entirely created by that. Yeah. So software wrote this video game. And it looks pretty impressive, yeah, nice visual um, graphics. So what, what happens there is you're on a, in, a, in a galaxy, in a, a spacecraft, and you land on certain planets, have to find stuff and move on to the next planet. Yeah? And it, it infinity, uh, infinitively created games. You can play it forever if you want it. Now the interesting thing is what happens when you look at reviews. Yeah, uh, right away it saves you money. This is an unholy mess of 50 bucks. User score of 2.5, uh, <coughs> that's very low, yeah? Um, or a 61 meter score. So th this game, essentially, is incredibly boring. Yeah? So it's a, it's a uh, automatically created, procedurally generated game, an invention that lacks ingenuity, that lacks creativity, that lacks that sort of human spark, <coughs> right? So what comes out of this, and this is sort of a tipping point where we are at the moment, is that we, that we have to figure out where exactly that sweet spot is between some of the advantages that you get from digitally driven innovation and some of the advantages that you may, may still have from human driven innovation. Yeah? So scale and speed, that could go up perhaps. Maybe even the efficacy of that process. So with the efficacy, I mean like more, more value for money, so to speak. Uh, but maybe you're sacrificing creativity and ingenuity. And you see that I put a lot of questions about there because I frankly don't know. And I, I'd like to say that no one else does either. Yeah. So we are at this moment in time where we have capabilities of having examples and stories like Norman Sky, the Hagrod, and, and the computer generated pizza, who are fairly fascinating case examples, but we will obviously have to wait and see where exactly that sweet spot is. It's probably not a curve that's going to tip over entirely to the right hand side. But we know also very, a lot of examples where 
We're relying only on human-driven innovations like Edison and Da Vinci in their labs. It's also not going to solve the world's biggest problems either. Yeah. So what that all means, and now I'm, I'm coming to the end here, is these types of innovation and invention, as they are becoming digitalized, are fundamentally social technical. Well, that's another academic term, but what we mean by this is this is something that happens when technology, people, and even organizations come together. And that's sort of what, what we're doing, or what I'm doing um, in my research and my teaching. That's the sort of stuff that interests me, the intersection where these three things meet.